Good to be back with you. Hello, hello. It's nice to, uh, always a pleasure to, to be live and to be talking about languages and answering your questions. You know how much I enjoy this time that we spend together every week. And yeah, today I've got some big news because um, last week, if you remember, I mentioned the idea of reaching out and having an event in a place near you. And as if by magic, I was using this background of London last week, and maybe it sent a subliminal message to somebody, but um, it looks like we're going to be having an event in London on the 24th and 25th of September, which means that we're going to have two days. Um, we'll do two separate days, so uh, if you go to one day, you don't need to go to the other. But what we'll do is we'll have two days of events on the Saturday and then on Sunday. So you have a choice of which one you want to come to. Um, and what I want to do, first of all, is just find out if any of you are interested in coming or being the first to know before we have any tickets on offer. Um, just because, yeah, you come to me and you're my <laughs> loyal people every week. So I wanted to tell you first. The idea behind it is that basically we do some nice language learning sessions. So we answer questions that are quite typical for language learning. And we're having it in quite a special location, which you'll find out soon enough if you are coming. And it's going to be actually in a really cool place with uh, a little twist as well to the, the day. So we're going to get to, um, to, to play with some stuff. We're going to get real uh, actual hands-on practice and uh, using um, techniques for language learning and also learn some language too. So there's going to be quite a lot going on. And if you have noticed, those of you who are sort of in with all of this, you know, celebrations of languages, you'll notice that it's the 24th and 25th, which is the weekend before the Monday, which is the 26th of September, which is the European Day of Languages. That's absolutely not an accident. So yes, it's got this European Day of Languages theme to it too. And I really hope to see some or as many of you as possible there. It'd be fantastic. Um, I'm not quite sure 100% on the capacity. So it's good to get your email in and just fill out the form that I've linked to in the YouTube video. There's a little form and just write in that you want to come to London and um, that you're interested in that weekend. You can even specify which day if you want to. And what we'll do is we'll contact you first before we open up to anyone else. I want to make sure that we we get people there who really want to be there as well and sort of are into um, know me and maybe might find it interesting to meet me. And I'd definitely like to meet you if, if you've uh, been following me and if you're on this live, it would be really, really cool to meet in person and break bread with you, not just, you know, you know, talking about languages, of course, but also just to actually enjoy time together. I, I think it's a really important thing. So, yeah, if you're interested, please fill it out and um, and let's see if we can we can catch up in person in London. Um, I think it will be a really, really cool thing to do. Uh, so the idea is that we will talk about lots of different topics, sort of the, the types of topics that come up. Um, and then because we'll be in person, we'll also deal with individual questions and go a little bit deeper. And because we'll have the time as well during breaks and during lunch and stuff like that, we'll be able to um, talk to you on an individual uh, level too. The really cool thing is, is I've also managed to talk to some other people to come to give sessions and they're quite cool people. So I, I think you're going to enjoy it. And um, so it'll be a kind of a group effort. It'll be lots of really nice people, um, really nice venue and um, food. <laughs> So if you if you want to come and you fancy um, you're doing something a bit different with your weekend on the 24th and 25th and you'd like to spend some time with me and lots of other lovely language learning people, then please feel free to reach out and uh, and just let me know and we'll make sure that you get your, your name on uh, the list as one of the first to hear the details of how to officially sign up uh, before anyone else. And we will prioritize the people who are on that list. So you're, you, you, you've got the best chance of being part of it if you want to be part of it. So <laughs> there's that that's happening, which I think is going to be super, super cool. Um, and the, um, the other thing I wanted to mention was that I got 
a few questions about like blockages in language learning. Like, what, what do you find difficult? So I asked the question, what are your blocks in language learning? Well, um, I got a few answers to that. And uh, one was Duplo, which I think on Twitter was, <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was quite funny, actually. A bit of a joke, but yeah, obviously, uh, Duplo blocks. <laughs> maybe maybe it's other blocks if it's you, I don't know. Um, but I did get other questions um, about one here that I found really interesting was, is it compelling input or just comprehensible input that's important? Um, that's a really, really good question. So the idea of comprehensible input for anyone who's not aware is this idea that Steve Krashen um, talks about. Um, he's a very capable um, language learner and linguist, and he, um, he he supports the idea that basically we put forward the idea that we, we learn mostly through comprehensible input. Now, that's kind of in a nutshell of what he says. He says a lot more clearly. And uh, Steve Kaufman also uh, talks a lot about this as well. And in fact, it's, I think, one of the founding reasons for Link, his platform, right? So if, you, if you're talking about input, yes, input is uh, really important. Um, the compelling or comprehensible. Comprehensible, I think, is probably the overriding thing because if it's not comprehensible, then it's going to be more difficult if you're reading extensively or if you're reading intensively, <laughs> then potentially the comprehensibility can be secondary. I'm more on the side of, um, I, I would tend to read um, something I want to read in uh, in a more intensive way rather than an, ex an extensive way. Um, there are many reasons behind that. and I can do a separate uh, video on that another time. Uh, but the whether it's compelling, I think, is important because if you are not enjoying what you're reading, are you going to carry on reading it? So you have to ask yourself these questions, right? I mean, you can choose to take input and lots of it, but if it bores you to death and all you can do is you can't wait to put the book down or to stop reading or to stop being um, you know, sort of subjected to a tyranny of, um, of text that bore you stupid, then perhaps that's not the most uh, useful thing for you to do. That said, if you can put up with reading things that you're not necessarily or naturally interested in, then yeah, I mean, seeing lots of language is always a good thing. So I, I, I you know what, Th there are no clear cut questions. <laughs> these things are there. The more I answer it, this is why I think these meetings in person are really important because you can ask questions back and you can, you can sort of discuss it and then see where the person is every time. Um, sometimes I appreciate that for, and I, I get this on TikTok, where I've made a couple of videos. One was about what's the hardest language. And I made this video, and all I've got are lots of, um, like, uh, imagine Gen Z um, people um, who write, bruh, three minutes, <laughs> and no answer. And I'm like, wow, well... well it's not an easy question to answer and <laughs> but yeah i mean it's it's quite funny to see but i understand the frustration of wanting a quick answer sadly quick answers aren't always the best a quick answer the only good thing about a quick answer is it's quick that's probably the only decent thing about it i think um if you want a proper answer then you need time and you need it to be particularly with language learning you need it to be an individual answer um an answer that Sometimes you can get your own answer from generic advice and, and it works. But for many people, we need an individual answer. We need to ask questions and for it to be a dialogue so that it works. And if something's not clear, I'd much prefer somebody speak up and uh, and, and talk to me about it. Um, OK, regularity. That's a good question. So regularity as, a, as an issue, general issue, stumbling block for language learning. Absolutely. Um, so you very often get uh, this issue of you start, you stop, you start, you stop, you start, you stop, you start, you stop. So the first question has to be why? Why are you doing that? Um, is it a problem with boredom? Is it a problem with um, you're trying to add to uh, your, your program of studies or work or home life, and whatever else you've got to do in life? Are you trying to add to something that's not compatible? Um, is it that what you're doing is actually boring and you don't really gel with it? Because that's also possible. Is it a problem that 
um, you've not been well, you've been stressed, you've got other external factors coming down on you. And many of these factors will influence whether or not you can continue in a in a natural way with your learning. So uh, absolutely regularity can be a problem. And that again is something that on an individual level, this can change. So these are the questions I would ask myself. And then what you can do is start to say, okay, well, am I trying to do too much? Once you've identified things that you do like and think, you know, uh, places where you can study and times if do work for you, then you've got to look at how much you're actually trying to do. Are you trying to get through an entire book in a, in, in a crazily short amount of time? Because if you are, is that really realistic for your lifestyle, for you, for your needs, for whatever else you're doing in life? If it's not, it's a problem. And do you need to reassess what you are actually doing and why you're doing it and when you're doing it so that you can make the most of your time and so that you do see an improvement as you move further forwards with your studies? Very often what I've uh, seen over the last couple of years with lots of questions from you and um, lots of questions that I've had in my language learning therapy sessions are to do with issues of um, having this desire to, to study a lot a lot more than we can actually manage, um, given the time that's available to us to then cycle through the same content to get the repetition that we need for it to become part of our long-term memory. And they're the kinds of issues that I see again and again. And each of these issues can be resolved with a tweaking of these different factors, materials, times, and when you study, how you study, where you combine things, um, looking for things to to add into the process, so whether it's you you get into the language and the culture, because the language and the culture really need to become part of your life. I mean, it's not that you add something to your life that needs to become part of your life, because if it doesn't, and if it doesn't become a, just a normal thing that you do, then it's a thing you have to remember to do. And if you have to remember to do something, you are very conscious of the fact that you have to remember to do it. And that in and of itself is an issue because you're very much more likely to not remember to do it. And, and therefore it becomes an issue to be able to study regularly. Um, someone said actually as well, not knowing what to do next. That can be an issue, it depends. That's a very general um, question in terms of to answer for me. Um, so depending on what that is, um, yeah, whether it's which materials to use next, how to move forward, how to, to do more stuff with the language and how to then use it. There are many, many issues there. There are lots of issues that we could, and I probably take um, lots of lives to, <laughs> and not lives as in people's lives, but lives as in live sessions to, <laughs> to answer the question about um, how we tackle that on each different level and layer where that type of question, that type of issue would, would arise. Okay, the other question I have here written down is speaking and writing German, because according to the teachers, uh, we have to battle genders. Um, yep, so an issue with a language like German is that there are three genders, and then you've got the plural as well, and there are changes to the nouns and adjectives depending on how you're using those in a sentence and that's because German um, has what we call cases so these cases mean that we make a change to the the word the that we have in English to each individual part of um, the for every noun so in in German you have der Mann the man die Frau the woman and das Kind the child but what happens is when you see them, so in German, ich sehe, I see, I don't say ich sehe der Mann, I say ich sehe den Mann, D-E-N. So it changes from an R to an N. And that's because this is a case, it's called the accusative case in German. So you have to make this change and you have to do this with all nouns um, that are masculine, that's the same change. And if you speak, to the, the, the woman, uh, die Frau, stays the same, and das Kind stays the same as well. But then if you're talking about something with uh, the man, ich spreche mit dem Mann, I speak with the man. Um, 
So mit dem, mit is with, and dem is then, D-E-M is the. So you've got already now three versions of the for masculine nouns only, der, den, and dem. And this is where people worry a lot about German with this. Um, fortunately, it does get easier with practice. Um, um, some of these things you get used to saying. So I used to always find that, for, for me personally, the thing I found weird in the beginning was that it was die Frau, and then in the dative case, which is with the mit dem Mann, um, in German for with the woman, you'd say mit der Frau. So it sounds like you're saying der Frau, right? Like in der Mann, and it sounds weird, and it is a bit weird to get your head around, but it's only when you learn it, and I, I found that if I learned it with the prepositions that went with it actually learning it in context was way easier for me than learning tables that i had to remember so my advice to you if you have a language like german or russian or anything else with cases particularly is to learn them almost as set phrases so that you get used to very common set phrases that you're going to say all the time so if you do that uh, then you'll find that over time you'll get you'll add more and more to them and then the actual rules kind of make sense because you start to see the patterns and so not worrying about learning the tables without the actual nouns and the um, the articles is is often the best way of doing it so my advice is always to learn things in context in that way and this is where I think, you know, when we were talking earlier about uh, comprehensible input, it's seeing language in real life, in a real situation, how it's being used, how it's being adapted, how it's being changed. And that's a really powerful thing, because if we know that we need to say things all the time, then we should learn those things that we need to say all the time, because we can then fit them together so that we make phrases. So let me take English as an example, okay? because I'm speaking English now, and it's probably the, the language that m most of you will know. So if I say to you, for example, I learn on Saturday, okay? Now in English, we say on Saturday, as in the day of Saturday that will be sort of next, the next available Saturday, right? On Saturday, I'm going to the shop. So as a simple future way of saying, I will go to the shop, we say I'm going in a more colloquial way in English. So this is kind of an idiosyncrasy of English that you you can you can learn. And then when you're talking about what you're doing at the shop, then you learn the phrases and I will buy and then whatever you want to buy. And if you do that, you will know what you need to adjust and swap out of sentences. So if you let's say it's not on Saturday, it's on Sunday and you're going to the swimming pool. You say, on Sunday, I'm going to the swimming pool. Or on Monday, I'm going to German class. On Friday, I'm going to the gym. So all you're doing is you're using the same on with the day of the week, and then I'm going to, and then wherever you're going. So you learn it in a very simple way, and you can expand that, that whole idea out to pretty much anything you want. I mean, and... When you learn languages like Chinese or um, where, where, where patterns are very, very important, um, you need to know, OK, I, I use this and this to make this sense of this thing that I want to say. In, in some languages, like in the Latin languages, uh, French, Spanish, um, Italian, Portuguese, you have all the conjugations and things. So things do change a little bit more. There are more, few, quite a lot more changes, but you can still learn in that same pattern-based way and it, it, it serves you well because you get used to the patterns and then you stop being able to adapt the patterns and use them in a more spontaneous way and that really is all language learning is about is getting used to patterns and <laughs> i mean i make it i'm sort of making it sound obviously as uh, as broken down as it possibly can be but yeah that's basically all it is it's just learning these patterns and making them fit and manipulating them and, and using them for your to your own end to change meaning and say what you want to express. That's basically all you're doing every time. Um, so I hope that those questions are answered well enough for those of you who asked and were interested in what I had to say on those topics. As I say, um, when we get together in London on the 
4th and 25th, um, we'll have uh, lots of cool topics from pronunciation to memorizing words and um, helping out with questions just generally about language learning uh, so that we get the most out of our time together. And um, yeah, we will um, we'll spend time answering your very specific questions. Okay, now I can see, talking about specific questions, I can see that there are some specific questions in the chats. So let me go back to the chats now and just have a look and see what I can answer. I will do my best to answer as many as I possibly can as I, as I usually do. And uh, hopefully I will get to every single one. Let me see. So I'm starting on Instagram because I've got more uh, things coming up here on Instagram. Uh, okay. Would love to come to London to see you. Oh, well, you'd be very welcome. So please do fill it in. Thank you very much. Um, hello, hello, all the hellos. Wow, thank you. Um, hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Let me see. Any chances of you coming to talk in Manchester? Possibly, but um, if, you're, if you're in Manchester, you're only a short train ride from London. And the day won't start until about 10, p 10 a.m., and it'll run just for the day, so until around four or five in the afternoon. So from 10 a.m. to four or five in the afternoon is what we're looking at for a um, schedule. But if you're in Manchester, I don't know when I'll be back to Manchester. So if you want to come, you're very, very welcome to you to come down. You, I mean, if you're in Manchester and in the UK, I mean, the train line had really cheap tickets um, for the days of the, 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 that it's on. I, I, I know I got some really good deals, actually. Uh, so, yeah, have a look and see. Um, but maybe in the future, Manchester, if um, I get the opportunity. Uh, let me see. Yes. Da, 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 da. Yes, from someone else saying, come on the train to London. It's only two hours. It is. It's not that far. I mean, it's we've got the fast trains now. What are the chances you'll ever do a live stream in another language? Well, these languages are multilingual sometimes. And I also do, I have done live streams with other creators, in particularly in Portuguese, actually. I've done quite a lot with Brazilian um, creators and we just speak Portuguese for the whole live. Um, I'm thinking, I've done some in German. I think I've done some, I think I've done some in French and I've done some in Spanish, I'm pretty sure. Um, but Brazilian Portuguese is probably the one I've, with the Brazilian creators, I've done quite a few of those um, various times during the pandemic, because I was invited on quite a few of the, the channels of very nice Brazilian creators who teach languages. And, um, and that was a lot of fun. But my own channel, yeah, I mean, they're, they're multilingual. So when I get questions, I, I do often answer in other languages. I just... Um, don't know, maybe I, I, I could. There's nothing wrong with me doing it, I suppose. Um, the hardest thing about German genders is there's no intuitive way of working out the gender of the noun, like, say, Spanish. So if you have to learn, learn them as you, you have to learn them as you go. There is some truth in that. There are certain endings that you can figure out. I mean, th there is a book that I had year from years ago it's this um hammer's german grammar book and in here they do go through some very typical endings for german nouns that you can learn so there are some some rules um but yeah i mean most of the time you have to learn the noun the, the noun gender and um and the plural quite often as well uh together so that you can remember them well but yeah it's one of the things with German that's a little bit, but it's weird. You start getting used to even that. You start getting used to, and if you make a mistake, I mean, it's not look. It's not the end of the world, and it's not like there are a few nouns that have different genders and mean different things in some languages. But um, you know, it's it's not the end of the world. I mean, it's a language. We all make mistakes and we communicate, and then we learn, or sometimes even don't learn. We just communicate. Um, uh so a german okay let me see okay this is where german can learn from swedish <laughs> only in n et, and it gets out of the at the end of the uh, noun to become the 
Yeah, ju- Swedish actually, um, with the, the, the sort of the suffixing of the definite article, um, so board, board it, table, the table, so et board, board at the table. Yeah, that's, it's an interesting phenomenon thing in in Scandinavian languages generally. Um, but I'll tell you one thing I found very odd with Swedish when I was learning it is that to know the plural of the noun wasn't always obvious because if you pick up a Swedish book like let's say a bird book in Sweden they often don't write the n or et um, in, in, in the thing and I remember asking one of my friends I don't know if they changed this in the, in the meantime but I said to one of my friends how on earth do Swedes know if they see a new word if it's n or et because it's not written and and she looked at me and she said I have no idea um, so I don't know of any any Swedes out there. Have you have you ever come across this problem in Swedish, um, where where you've been learning a new word and it's just labelled with the name of whatever it is? Uh, how how do you know? Do, do you know? I mean, do, do you know what it is? Because I I couldn't see a sensible way as to see how or a logical way as to see how how you would know just from a Swedish book on like an encyclopedia type book, right? Where you just have labels and of like words on pictures and things. They just had the name. They didn't have like the no n or et at all. And I was like, well, not for, not only that, but also then, how do you know the rules that it follows necessarily? You for the plural, you wouldn't necessarily know. I don't believe so. Um, yeah, interesting question back at any Swedish speakers out there. Um, I've never had that answered properly, and I've asked a few Swedish friends, and they they don't know. Um, Okay, German cases, yes. Yeah, German cases are, are an interesting thing. I know people um, people do worry a lot about them. Actually, you okay, so German speakers out there are going to kill me for saying this, but um, there are German speakers who speak variations of, um, of other languages within Germany. And when they speak standard German, they don't always use the cases correctly. And I know there'll be Germans out there saying, ah, it's not true, it's not true. It, it is. It, it, it demonstrably is because I've um, I've heard it and I've heard uh, people from Germany get the cases wrong. Um, but it's not that com- It's not hugely common. It's not an everyday thing, but it, it does happen. Um, so as a foreigner learning it, I mean, yeah don't worry too much you you need to get it to a degree that's why i say learn learn patterns of things that you'll say often but then if you're if you're sort of innovating on that and trying to say new things then don't worry too much if you get it wrong it's look it's not going to hamper meaning that much and german noun cases i mean they're not as crazy as some of the slavic ones um I mean, there's only a certain number, right, of endings that you can have in German. And the actual nouns themselves, apart from in a couple of cases, they don't really change. So you only you only see changes in things like, um, yeah, matrosa is the word for a sailor. Um, and, but then if it's in the accusative, you, you have to add matrosen. Um, but you're just adding an N. And if you don't say the N, people still understand what you're saying when you're using it in the case. Um, whereas, you know, in a in, in a in a Slavic language, they can change quite drastically. Um, yeah, I mean, so yeah, I would I would uh, I would not worry too much. Um uh hen and het, uh, oh sorry, uh, het and the in in Dutch, yeah, the and het. Okay. Um, yeah, they can. Uh, that's how you learn the 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 head and the in Dutch. Okay, in context. Yeah, in the in in Dutch, it's 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 a bit more probably a little bit more intuitive. I guess. I, mean, I maybe I'm saying that because I'd learned German first. I found it more intuitive, but um, but yeah, it, in context is always good, and learning what you need when you need it. Zdrastly, zdrastly. <laughs> Um, let me see. Okay, make sure I answer all the right questions. Here we go. So, yeah, I'm getting lots of hellos and hellos and hellos and waves and hello, 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 hello. Um, mistake 
is the pillar to learn. Absolutely. I really agree with that. Yeah. Making lots of mistakes is really important. I've made so many mistakes in lots of languages. And yeah, you learn from them. It's, and sometimes they become quite fun stories that you can tell people as well. It becomes, gets quite cool. Um, okay. How much of a perfectionist should I be when battling a language? Okay. Mistakes is... C2 level flawless. No, no. There is no flawless level in any language, not even monolingual, educated, um, first language speaker. It's still not, still not flawless. Um, because everyone, we're all human, we make mistakes, we mispronounce, we miss say things, we we trip over our words, we confuse things. And so there's no such thing as flawless. That's just that doesn't exist. I mean. I can guarantee that none of you on, on this live speak any of your languages, including your own language, absolutely flawlessly all of the time. And if you can and you say you can, then I'm sorry, but you're sadly mistaken. Um, I know I make mistakes in English sometimes and it's quite normal. Um, I misspeak or I'm tired and I don't, I'm not thinking. Um, or just sometimes I don't know. Sometimes I make a mistake because I don't know. Um, I'm using something in a way that I've not used it before and I might get it slightly wrong or I might have mislearned it. I don't, but you only find out in time. So flawless doesn't exist. Um, and C2 certainly isn't. So, I mean, I've met people who have passed their C2 exams in, in languages and, and yeah, I was, I, I could hear uh, mistakes as well. Um, it's not a problem. It's not, that's not an issue. Uh, it's just natural. Um, let me see. Hola, hola, todo bien. Hola. Oh, wow. Anion Haseyo. Ah, Richard, Anion Haseyo. Anion Haseyo. Cholo yo. Is that right? I don't know. word. I've not used Korean for so long. I've not been speaking any Korean for like months now. It's so sad because I did like a year of it during the pandemic and it went so slowly, but it was really bad. But yeah, <laughs> hopefully I'll get back to Korean again at some point. I, I did enjoy it. I enjoyed the study groups that I went to. I really liked them. Um, okay, I'm going over to to YouTube to have a look at the comments on there. Uh, I'm interested. Okay, Steve, you're interested. Cool. Yeah, it'd be good to see you. If you've got your name on the, on the list, we'll be in touch. Um, I hope you meet this. Yeah, it'd be really good to meet you. Um, now, Richard, learn, hearing your voice is always soothing. Hope you're having a lovely day. Oh, thank you, Eva. You're so kind. Thank you. That's really sweet. Thank you very much. Uh, Craig, I'll be in Greece until the 26th. Sod's like, oh, no, Craig, because you're in London as well. And you're, you're actually around there with your family. Oh, no, never mind. Um, hopefully another time. <laughs> Hopefully, hopefully it won't be the last time, but I mean, I don't know. I can't, I can't promise at the moment. It's kind of trying, trying out and seeing how it works, but it's cool. It's a cool thing to be able to do, but yeah, hopefully another time, Craig. Um, hey Richard, are you in London? Not at the moment. I'm not, uh, not as well. I'm not at the moment, but I will be in London for that weekend, 20, um, 24th and 25th of September. I'll be in London for this uh, set of workshops on the Saturday and the Sunday. Hola, um, le admiro mucho. Estoy en Inglaterra ahora mismo. Estoy aprendiendo inglés. ¿Algún consejo? Pues ven, ven, ven a mi taller. Vas a hablar conmigo, entonces podemos hacer algo. Fernando, puedes escribir en, porque tengo un vínculo ahí uh, por debajo de mi, de mi canal, de, de este vídeo en YouTube. Así que me puedes escribir y a ver si vas a venir. Porque así podemos hablar así, en plan para, para saber lo que, lo que te va bien, lo que te molesta, por ejemplo, en, en tu aprendizaje del inglés. Pero sí que podemos hacer algo. Un consejo, pues hablar. Hablar eso sí que es muy importante. Uh, utilizar el idioma para lo que sea, para, para comunicar con, con otra persona. Uh, dependiendo de donde, donde estés en el Reino Unido, por ejemplo, también uh, va a tener... Um, algo que ver con cómo puedes utilizar el idioma durante el día, por ejemplo, si estás trabajando en inglés o estudiando, si tienes, por ejemplo, no sé, 
um, con quién hablar, dónde ir para, para utilizar tu idioma, para hacer una cosa que, que te guste. Eso sí que son cosas muy importantes. Uh, así que escríbeme en, en el vínculo, puedes um, rellenar este de... Um, es un Google Sheet, así que puedes rellenar este, y el formulario, y, y nos vemos a lo mejor en Londres. My native language is Dutch. I have a daily calendar with something about Dutch language every day. I'm still learning something from the language I grew up in. Absolutely, Alfonso, absolutely. Thank you for writing that. Completely true. I could learn things in English all the time as well. I mean, it's like, never ends, really never ends. Um, you're never ready to learn. You're, you're never ready to, le uh, to learn. Language. Exactly, you're always learning, always learning a language, uh, even your own. Niha, Niha. Let me see. Okay, back to back to, to Instagram. Uh, me deja solucionando que haya adquirido este nivel de español andaluz <ríe> tan nativo. Enhorabuena. Es un placer eh, escucharte. Muchas gracias. Lo agradezco mucho. Es que viví con Andaluz, viví con Malaina, así que sí, que aprendí así uh, con ello hablando todos los días en, espa en español, pues andaluz. <ríe> y había dos, dos malagueños y, y una chica de Galicia. Y con la que llega, así que también sabía imitar un poco el, el acento gallego, pero, pero no hablaba así. Así que porque con, con ellos siempre hablaba español. Y así aprendí el idioma. Y luego me fui para estudiar en, en Málaga. Y así que quedó el deje andaluz. Más, más que, que nada más. A ver. Pero muchas gracias. Speaking Russian. Uh, speaking Spanish. I'm not sure what you mean. Hablando español. How, speaking Russian. I'm not sure what you mean. Speaking Spanish, speaking Russian. Do you mean you want me to speak in Russian? Um, if you do, you can always ask me a question in Russian. I'm very happy to, to answer. Um, yeah, it's a language that I can just about manage, I think. Um, muy bien. <laughs> Mara Garcia. So, um, I mean, if you do have any questions, obviously, feel free to, to reach out. Um, my whole goal, I mean, since the pandemic started, really, is, is to share um, the language learning journey, to be as honest and open as I possibly can about language learning, about what the reality is, versus the polished versions that we see sometimes online. Um, the things that we perceive as normal or real or um, versus actually what is normal and real. And um, the reality is often, as I find, quite different to um, what we imagine. And and that's not really, I think, somebody, I don't think anyone's really particularly to blame. I think that what social media is about is showing uh, the best or the worst of, of things and the, the bits in between are what take up most of our day. I mean, that's what our day is made of, right? Those things. And the the, the sad reality is that the, the mundane, the, the ordinary, is not exciting for social media. So people don't share it so much. Everything's kind of polished for the good or not, or sort of very raw for the bad. And so we only tend to see those two extremes. So what happens, I find, is that we, we get into this mindset of everybody's doing amazingly well and some people sometimes are doing really, really badly. But we don't see the sort of the bit in between. And I, I want to highlight the bits in between. Um, uh, I mean, as, as unexciting and as unsexy as they can possibly be sometimes, they are the reality. And when we've got a grip on what the reality of language learning is, which is a, a long-term process and takes time for it to really sit, in, you know, sort of sink into our our memories, into our minds, into our heads. It's um, yeah, sadly that as boring as it might be, it, it, it is boring for people to, to listen. Obviously, um, same with anything. Look at the news, either terrible or great. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, really good. Um, Thing to see, yeah. So the news often, yeah, it will be yeah terrible or great, and often terrible and not very much great, unfortunately. I follow some uh, people on TikTok who share good news stories because I want more good news stories to balance out the negative ones, which are just all the time. Um, 
because you know like you say if you watch the news it's like it's mostly actually quite negative but um but it's it's one of the other it's not the mundane and it's but life isn't that life is life is mostly for most of us the mundane and the mundane then we get bored with the mundane and we get um tired of the mundane and we think that we should have more exciting things going on and it's not reality it's just not reality and um, language learning is not um always exciting or sexy or it just isn't um, and uh, it, it takes time and patience and practice and getting things wrong and uh, lots of repetition and <laughs> trying and trying and trying and trying and trying and trying and, and uh, making mistakes and then trying to repair them and lots and lots of things it's it's work and it's work and and we don't sort of talk about we don't talk about our, our daily jobs for example all the time unless you've got kind of a daily job maybe that's that's super sort of exciting I mean, maybe for a stunt person for for a film set it might be more exciting to, to talk about it because you what stunt you did and you could film that more easily but if you, if you do like ordinary jobs i mean you know imagine if you're a doctor you're not going to go around with a with a camera filming the patients or, or something that'd be really random and also really unethical but um it'd be really random to do that wouldn't it and you, you're not going to do it but that's your mundane right so you know as, as some even in a, a profession that we imagine is going to be you know, sort of a really uh, well-paid or highly educated profession like a doctor most of their days are not going to be these exciting things and sometimes it's going to be that exciting it's actually they need to they need to just sort of slow things down when they finish or they need to sleep to, to regain their own energy levels so all of the things that we imagine are based on these extremes that we see on a daily basis and um and and and, and getting used to that is, is quite crazy um где вы учили русский язык um в кишневе а вот тоже я делал я сделал по курс в Испании это было в Мадриде а потом я жил и работал в Молдавии и там я говорил и по румынски и по по русски но для меня по русски говорить это чуть-чуть лучше потому что я говорю по македонски дома и это тоже славянский язык и поэтому я думаю что но ну, это было э, очень легко но это было в порядке для меня э, у вас есть особенно что это э, сладкие воспоминания я думаю что нет э, у меня тоже только по по-моему, я думаю, что но когда я, я начал говорить по многих языках, это, это было для меня возможность тоже э, пом э, пометить еще лучше и другие слова э, от разных яз языков. Потому что там, в принципе, когда ты изучал одно слово, потом это не только трудно изучать еще дальше слово, а которые то слово очень подобные или у вас тоже спрощение или я не знаю или часть слова тоже может быть подобная как в другом языке и, и поэтому это очень помогает с улучшением языков и поэтому я думаю что ну, это возможно для меня тоже и шас говорит по-русски и с ошибками нормально конечно но я могу коммуниковать использовать русский язык для коммуникации и это потому что это тоже славянский язык и это никогда не будет для меня что будет как, например, по-арабски говорит, это, это тоже очень разный, разный язык для меня. Но русский это как славянский язык, как македонский, как сербский, как болгарский, как чешский. Что я изучал на университете, я потом э, использую шас дома. Э, и поэтому, ну, и когда я путешествую, э, я думаю, что ну, э, в каждой стране там э, люди, которые говорят, говорят по-русски, 
и, и тоже это помогает с коммуникацией, потому что ну, там я, они очень часто не говорят по-английски, не только говорят по-русски. И, и поэтому это, you know, самом деле, я тоже в Тореце. Я, когда я, я в Истанбуле, я говорю только по-торецки, потому что там не говорят очень хорошо по-английски, очень часто. И, и поэтому, ну, окей. Okay, this is interesting. Non-Instagrammable things are usually the cause of where progress that's got given birth to Insta Instagram Instagrammable things uh, that people usually do. I can end up showing. Yeah, there is a thing like that. I mean, things that people want to uh, see. And I get it, right? I mean, people buy these, these cool magazines and they buy all the latest things because they want to see something exciting, something that's not from their normal life. And um, what I find really interesting is I, I sometimes, on, on, on my private Facebook, I will document some of my very normal life, right? Because uh, it's a good place to do it. But, but I take a picture from a certain angle and I, I show it in a different way, maybe, than people are used to. What I find really interesting is some of the comments I get are, wow, you travel a lot, or you do this, or you do that. Or, I'm like, actually, not really, no. It's just that I, I took the time to go into my normal town or into places near where I'm from or where I live or where I'm staying. But most of my day is the normal day. Um, it's just I went out one day with a camera, took pictures and put them on, on Facebook and shared them with friends. But it, it looks... People's perceptions, where I say people's perceptions are often really skewed as to what, what reality is, like really skewed. So, yeah, I, I always find it really interesting when I, when I see those kinds of comments because um, I, I don't recognize myself in the comments, if that makes sense. Uh, uh, so, so, yeah, let me see if I can answer some more questions on Facebook. Not Facebook, on YouTube. My word, talking about Facebook and I'm thinking about Facebook. Okay. My native language is Portuguese, and I still come across words I don't know. Yep, so Donna, absolutely. There are always new, uh, there are always new things to learn about one's own native language. Absolutely, totally agree. I mean, English, you'll never, you'll never learn all the words in English. No one. There are too many of them. There's too many of them. It's just ridiculous. I mean, Gloucestershire, but indeed, Yehilnika yaya ke aderfi muado. Stin Anglia, ne? I've seen count, uh, communicating with cases, I know, but uh, pronouncing words has been corrected more, more often. Yeah, I mean, the Greek cases are not so terrible. I mean, they're kind of comparable to the German ones. Um, and what I found actually is Greeks and Germans tend to be able to learn each other's languages quite well because of the. Um, the grammatical similarities with the cases and how they're used. Um, but yeah, um, the, the the words themselves sometimes take time. I think for Greek, particularly with some of the more advanced vocabulary, it gets quite quite crazy because you have to go back almost to the, because of the ancient Greek, um, which isn't always the easiest thing to go back to, right? Um, okay, let me see. What's your official position on linguistic Scandinavian? I like that, like as in, what do you mean, Mr. Wondrous? Do you mean like sort of, it is, what do you mean? Um, I, I, don't, I don't quite get your question. Um, could you explain it a little bit more and expand on it? Um, let me see. I'm not seeing any more questions on Instagram, but um, I'll wait for an explanation on that one for that question. It's an interesting question. I don't know what it, I don't exactly know what you mean though. Um, I mean, languages generally, when it comes to, um, when it comes to learning them, like for example, like my, I was speaking Russian just before, um, the Russian I speak is Russian that I learned when I was in Moldova. And um, and I learned it because I needed to express things in commonly in Moldova in Russian and in Romanian, but a, a lot in Russian. And um, 
I found it when I learned it to start speaking with people, because before that I'd only ever really studied a bit of Russian, but I hadn't really done much with it. But then in Moldova, because I had to start putting it together and using it and speaking it, because uh, a lot of the speakers didn't know English. Um, and also because I wanted to learn, obviously, I, I mean, I would have, even if they spoke English, I would make myself speak Russian. But um, the, the interesting thing is because it's a Slavic language and because I speak a Slavic language at home, um, I found that it stayed with me because it's also far enough away to, to sort of not get too mixed up. I do make mistakes, obviously. I make mistakes in Russian, I make quite a lot of mistakes. And it doesn't sound like a Russian person speaking. Um, and sometimes I'll get words wrong. And that's all fine. Uh, because when I speak to Russians, uh, Russian speakers, should I say, uh, the communication flows and it, it does happen and it works. I mean, the language works. And I think this is one of the things where I always say it's good to, to recognize what you need the language for. Because if you can recognize what you need the language for, then it, it's easier to be happier with the results that, and with your study. Um, because if you want to just be perfect or you want to have this goal of getting to this crazy level in the language, it's, it, it's like standing in front of a mountain and not reaching the top and being disappointed with every step you take. Um, if you can be happy with all of the wins on the way, you can still have that mountain if you want in the distance. But to be just thinking of that mountain all the time is is, is super um, deflating. It's really, it, it's demotivating the whole thing. Okay. All right, what's up? So James Joyce created the word uh, scan. Scandi Cravery <laughs> in, in Finnegan's Wake, which is a bit of a, uh, okay, a portmanteau. Okay, but if if there is a deeper meaning, you would be the one who would know is all. Oh, okay. Scandi Cravery. I'm not sure what else I would read into it as a word. Um... So when I saw it, and the, my first Sandy Knavery, oh sorry, Knavery, not Cravery. I um I must have misread it. Sorry about that. Um, Sandy Knavery. Um, so when I look at the word itself, I see Scandi, which is like Scandinavian, and then I see. Weirdly, my brain goes to um, in the beginning when you first wrote it. I just write Scandinavary, like as in Scandinavian, um, as in languages or whatever. Um, but then when I look at Knavery, I my word goes to um, um, Knab, a Knab, which is like a boy in Esperanto. Um, but I mean, I don't think this was the intention, but my brain makes up stories about these things. And this is where my brain normally goes, right? I, I, I tend to um, look at words and and find meaning sometimes where there are is no meaning. Sometimes there is. It's a legitimate etymological root because um, obviously I've studied a number of languages now, so I I do see etymological connections um, between a lot of languages that I've I've studied, particularly because I've focused a lot on Indo-European languages. I will see a lot of Indo-European connections, um, but that's what I would see if I saw it. If that's what you mean, um, but much more than that. No, I would. It would be a for me that would be kind of a, a play thing that I would I would play with that kind of stuff. Yeah. Thanks. You're very welcome. Yeah. Interesting question though. I, I like the question. It made me think a bit about the um, knabo. It's not a word that I use. I'm trying to think where else that word comes from. It came to me in Esperanto for some reason. Um, and I think because of V's and B's are often. You see, this is the thing that it does right. Whenever I hear of a word. I think of which words, which letters are often changed and morphed from language to language. V's and B's often get, get um, changed, or F's as well. Um, they they tend to get changed around. But yeah, that's that's kind of what I see. Um, I don't see any more questions. I think I got to the end of the questions, which is amazing. 
who thought who, who would have thought i'd get to the end of the questions again i'm doing well with the questions i'm very impressed with myself <laughs> um hello chanel good to see you um how are you doing i'm doing okay thank you um always nice to see chanel um let me see i think i got to the end of the questions so if that's it for this week then all i'll do is remind you to go to the form and fill it out if you want to come and join me uh, for the weekend in London. It would be very, very nice to see you there if you can make it. And um, when I get the list of people who are interested, then I will send an email as soon as we have more details for you to make a decision on when to come. And um, it'll be a fun two, two days. So whether you join on the Saturday or the Sunday on the 24th or the 25th, it will be a fun day with you uh, at the event and um, we'll get to hang out, we'll get to talk languages, we'll get to learn together, we'll get to uh, break bread, we'll get to just chat and um, I think it'll be really cool. So, and it'll be a really cool place. So yeah, any questions as well, just let me know, just pop a, a message and uh, I'll see, hopefully I'll be able to answer any questions. But otherwise, fill out the form and you'll get the information you need. And if you've got other places that you'd like me to go to in the future, you can also add that into the form as well. And um, if you want to host an event, obviously let me know too. You can do that in the form too. It's the same form that I had last week. I'm just going to repurpose it for this uh, London event. And um, and we'll, we'll keep using it so that we, we, we get to figure out where we meet up in real life. Now that um, things have eased in terms of restrictions, I really like the idea of meeting up with you in person and um, and doing that whenever we can. So thank you so much and um, have a wonderful rest of your weekend, uh, wherever you are in the world and have a great week of language learning. And I will look forward to seeing you same time, same place next week. Any ideas for what you wanna talk about, just pop them in the comments and I'll be reading the comments. I may not always reply, but I do read them. And um, and I'll see if there's something that sticks out that I can take on as a topic for you next week. Uh, so I would I would rather do things that are important to you. Uh, so feel free to do that, and I will pick something that comes up and uh, and run with it. Okay, take care. Thanks again. Bye bye.